We've seen how to test hypotheses about one of the coefficients, such as whether a coefficient of slope is equal to zero, and that requires using a t-test typically, and uh, often the result is included as part of the regular output of a regression run in R or other statistical software. I want to talk about the idea of testing joint hypotheses now. When we have multiple regressions, sometimes we're interested in hypotheses that involve more than one coefficient and possibly a number of different equations. So let's consider a concrete example. This goes draws from the test score uh, school district example that we've been using previously in the class. So we've run the following regression. We've got the test score is the dependent variable for district I, and it's a linear function of the student-teacher ratio, STR, the average family income in the district, AVGINC, and the percentage of kids who are on subsidized meal plans, often considered a rough measure of the local poverty rate. And we want to test the null hypothesis that both beta 2 and beta 3 are zero, so that neither average income nor the meal percentage variables actually have any effect on test score once we control for the student-teacher ratio. So that would be a null hypothesis, such as this one here, H0, beta 2 equals zero, and beta 3 equals zero. And we call that a joint hypothesis because it involves those two different parts. Now the alternative hypothesis in this case, H1, is what's true if the null is not true, and that is not beta 2 equals 0 and beta 3 equals 0. And you can see that can happen either because beta 2 is not equal to 0, or beta 3 is not equal to 0, or in fact both of them are not equal to 0. That's how we reject in this case. So this is an example of a joint hypothesis it involves two or more restrictions on the coefficients, <coughs> often two or more coefficients. A restriction is often expressed as an equation. And so what do I mean by a restriction? Well, a restriction in this case is that beta 2 is equal to 0. So in other words, our hypothesis uh, embodies restricting the possible values of one or more of the coefficients. And joint hypotheses involve two or more restrictions. And we use the letter Q to indicate the number of restrictions in a particular null hypothesis. In this case, we have two restrictions beta 2 equals 0 and beta 3 equals 0 as our null hypothesis. And the Q will come in in a way we'll talk about in a bit. So there are many possible joint hypotheses for a regression such as the one I was just looking at. One null would be that all three of the slope coefficients are equal to 0. Beta 1 equals 0, beta 2 equals 0, and beta 3 equals 0. And in fact that hypothesis is typically tested with the F statistic that shows up in regression tables. We're not going to look at that one today. Another would, example would be of a null hypothesis would be beta 2 equals beta 3. Now that's not actually a joint hypothesis because it really only involves one restriction, but it is an unusual hypothesis in that it is that the two equa uh, coefficients are equal to one another. Uh, this one here is a joint hypothesis. How many restrictions? We can usually judge how many restrictions by looking at how many equal signs it takes to state the hypothesis. And in this case that's 2. So q equals 2 for this one. q equals 3 up here because we had three restrictions and in fact this one is just q equals 1. So there's many possible hypotheses. It's really a question of what you're interested in asking and answering as you look at your regression results. Now how can we conduct such a test as the first one we looked at, namely h0, that beta 2 equals 0 and beta 3 equals 0? Now, you might think that we could just look at the separate t-tests for each coefficient, and then we would reject this joint null hypothesis if one or both of those are significantly different from zero. So we would be basically viewing it as kind of a compound test. Does beta 2 equal zero? Hmm. Does beta 3 equal zero? If we can reject either of those, then obviously it seems like we have rejected the joint hypothesis. This, however, turns out not to be the right way to do it. No, no, no. And there's a couple of reasons for that, why this is not an adequate way to, to conduct a joint hypothesis test. Let's look at the reasoning behind that. Why not use separate t-tests, one for each of the restrictions? Well, let's start by the assumption, which is actually usually not going to be true, that the beta 2 and beta 3 estimates, I should put a hat over these, to indicate that they're the estimates, are uncorrelated. Now what do I mean by that? 
As you look at random samples drawn from a population, we know that the slope coefficients are random variables themselves. They will vary from one sample to another. And as we run the regression on different random samples, we may find that beta 2 is higher in some samples and lower in others. And in fact, when beta 2 is higher, it may sometimes be the case that beta 3 also tends to be higher in that sample because of the way the x's are correlated with each other in the sample. So there's no reason to think that those two, vari those two coefficients that we estimate are uncorrelated, but for the moment, let's suppose that they are. Now, let's think about what happens if the null happens to be true, right? So beta 2 does happen to be equal to 0 and beta 3 equals 0 in the population. But we've run a, a regression on a particular sample and we have our sample statistics and we want to test this joint null hypothesis. Now, the way we would intuitively try to do it if we were using the t-tests would be that we would accept the null hypothesis, the joint null hypothesis, only if we don't reject either beta 2 equals 0 or beta 3 equals 0 using those two separate t-tests, like what shows up with the asterisks in a regression table. Now, at the 5% standard significance level, we would accept a true null hypothesis that beta 2 equals 0 with probability of 1 minus 0.05 equals 0.95. So in 0.95, or 95% of random samples, assuming that beta 2 really is 0, we would end up accepting that null. Of course, we would reject 5% of the time. That's what it means to have a 5% significance level. Similarly, if beta 3 is actually equal to 0, we will accept that true null hypothesis 0.95 or 95 percent of the time under the assumption that it is actually true and we'll reject 5 percent of the time. Now in order for us using this procedure to accept the true null hypothesis we need to accept that both of these things are true with the two separate t-tests. Since they're independent tests the probability that both of them are accepted is the probability of each one being accepted times the other, right? Because we just, the probabilities are multiplied together for independent random variables. When we do that, 0.95 times 0.95, we get 0.9025. That is the probability, using this 5% standard on each of the separate regression coefficients, 0.9025, or about 90%, is the probability that we accept the joint null hypothesis using that criterion. Now, that's not probably what we want to be doing, because that means that we're going to end up rejecting the true null hypothesis with a probability of 1 minus that acceptance rate, which is 0.0975, or 9.75%. In other words, even though we usually want to have a standard of 5% as our critical value for uh, rejection, in this case we're going to actually reject nearly 10% of the time when the null hypothesis is actually true. So the size of the test is actually incorrect when we do these two separate t-tests. Now what's going on here? The double t-test makes the mistake of exposing our joint hypothesis to what I think of as double jeopardy. That is, it can be rejected in two different ways. So if we don't reject it on beta 2, we go back and we subject it to the beta 3 test, and it turns out that's going to lead us to over-reject. Now if that were the only problem, you could actually make an adjustment of the size of the test to take account of this, and it wouldn't be too bad to use the separate t-tests. But there's another issue, and that is this one here beta 2 and beta 3, and therefore their t-statistics, are actually not usually independent of each other. So in fact, this cur the calculation of the probability of rejection is more complicated than I just suggested. It's actually quite a complicated problem because the beta 2 and beta 3 could move together or apart from each other across different samples, and that needs to be taken account of as well. So, we need a different technology for conducting joint hypotheses, and we typically do it using an f-test. And to do this, we calculate an f-statistic from the regression results. And what is an f-statistic? In effect, what it's doing is combining the separate t-stats in a way that takes account of their correlation and also of the double jeopardy problem. 
Now, for large samples, this F statistic that comes out of the, usually out of your regression software, actually, uh, for a joint hypothesis with Q restrictions is going to be distributed with an F distribution, that's a particular statistical distribution, with Q uh, degrees of freedom in the numerator and infinite degrees of freedom in the denominator. Now, what does that mean? I won't go into it, but you can look this up on a table. And, in fact, there is a table at the back, for example, of the Stock and Watson textbook of this distribution, or probably what most of us do most of the time, rely on our statistical software to run the test. Now, that leaves open the question, what's really going on with this F-test? And with a few extra assumptions, we can offer an interpretation of what this F-statistic is doing that maybe provides a little bit more intuition. So let me return to this uh, example I was dealing with. Consider a joint hypothesis with these two restrictions, that beta 2 equals 0 and beta 3 equals 0. And suppose we ran two different regressions. One of them we're going to call the unrestricted regression. And that's going to be the full model. So again, in our example, where this was the test score, that we're including the variables for student-teacher ratio. I just shorthanded it to x's for the in average income and for the meal percentage. We've included everything in there. Now, the restricted version of the regression would be to assume that the null hypothesis is true. And again, the null hypothesis up here is that both beta 2 and beta 3 are 0. So what we're doing here with this one is, for beta 2 and for beta 3, if we knew that the null were true, we could put the zeros in there. And that's, of course, going to lead to these whole expressions just going away. Because x2 and x3 don't belong in the regression. They add nothing to the regression if x2 and x3 actually have no effect on y. And so we're left with the restricted equation, which looks like this. And it's just got x1. We've dropped x2 and x3. Now, if the null hypothesis actually were true, then dropping those regressors, x2 and x3, say average income and the meal percentage, would have very little impact because it's only just by noise that they would have any effect in the regression. They're not actually doing anything in the real world. And therefore, the restricted regression should end up fitting nearly as well as the unrestricted. And how could we quantify this? Well, we know how to think about the fit of a regression. We use R squared. So one way to quantify this would be to see how much the R squared increases when you go from the restricted version to the unrestricted version of the regression. Right? We know when we add those variables, R squared always goes up. But does it go up by a lot? If it goes up by a lot, it suggests that the restriction was a bad idea. Now, in fact, if the errors are homoscedastic, so we don't have heteroscedasticity, not necessarily true in the real world, but assuming that we're true, we have a nice simple expression for the F statistic. The F statistic, namely, is given by this. And you can see there's some stuff over here that uh, has to do with scaling the thing. But this part here makes a lot of sense, right? The numerator of that is r squared for the unrestricted regression minus r squared for the restricted. So that's the gap. That's how much difference in fit there is between these. And then the denominator there is just scaling it to the 1 minus the unrestricted r squared. The little k, by the way, is the number of regressors in the unrestricted model. So if, in fact, the restricted model is much worse in fit, then there's going to be a big difference in this numerator. That's going to make the F statistic a big number. When F is a big number, we tend to reject the null hypothesis. And that's what we would want to do, because in that case, the restricted version is not fitting nearly as well as the unrestricted. So then it seems likely that beta 2 and beta 3 actually are having some effect in the regression. Those variables matter, and we reject that null hypothesis. So that's the idea of the F statistics. There's many, many nice ways, nice hypotheses that we can test using the F stat and uh, technology. And in R or other statistical software, simple to implement these and test some interesting possible joint hypotheses.